Uh, so my name is Dan Lear, uh, and I'm here from Duke University from the Center for uh, Genomic and Computational Biology. Uh, and I'm going to talk about how uh, one of our projects that we support has been adopting uh, CWL to uh, build uh, pipelines for genomic analysis. Uh, so just a, a quick bit about the, the center. Um, so we're part of Duke University, and we're uh, comprised of a number of cores. Uh, my group is the computational solutions uh, team. And so we provide infrastructure and some software development and consulting on things like uh, workflow languages and best practices and tools. Uh, and so we've been uh, teaming up with one of the labs in GCB, uh, the Ready Lab, uh, with uh, PI Tim Ready, who's been uh, working on this genomics of gene regulation project. And their goal is really to look at um, glucocorticoid response and the uh, regulatory network during uh, the first 12 hours of that response. And so to do so, uh, they're sequencing a lot of data, they're collecting a lot of data at those 12-hour time points, taking multiple replicates, and then running that through three different kinds of computational pipelines to provide uh, results and data that they can compare to really see what's happening during that response. Uh, and that's about as much as I know about the science. Uh, so why CWL? So I'm up here to uh, talk about why we looked at the workflow language. So the, the Ready Lab itself uh, is very very capable in building their, uh, their pipelines to, to analyze their data on our uh, computational infrastructure. And, but they came to us uh, asking about how to make these more uh, distributable, reproducible, and uh, we had been looking at some uh, Docker-based solutions, some custom stuff for uh, distributing workflows and distributing um, uh, binaries and tools packaged up together uh, and came across CWL and really found that a lot of the, the things that were built into the standard were a good fit, a good match at, at high levels for what we wanted to do, computational pipelines that run in sequence or in parallel, uh, and at low levels with uh, tool wrapping and, and compatibility with existing bioinformatics tools. Uh, so once I started looking into it and attending the community meetings, uh, I found it was a really great, strong community and a lot of smart folks that have, uh, that have thought of a lot of the things that uh, you know, to avoid uh, reinventing the wheel. And then finally, the, uh, the being a standard and having multiple implementations, uh, having this extensibility, plugability, and scalability. So it seemed like it was going to be a really good uh, match from the outset once we started looking at things. Uh, and so a couple of the things that were a little bit uh, challenging was, uh, you know, coming from a, a place of writing shell scripts tailored for a, a high-performance computing cluster, there was a bit of a paradigm shift to uh, sort of reimagine your workflow, reimagine your uh, pipelines in that declarative format. So there was a, a bit of a different uh, skill set required for building those. Uh, some of the way we would package things up or organize things changed a little bit, and we'll, we'll get into that. Um, and then in terms of, you know, isolating each step and, and clarifying dependencies and, and really making things performant were, was also a challenge. Uh, but there were a number of payoffs. So uh, once we have a, a, a workflow description we can pass around, uh, then we can repeat that, we can publish it, we can use uh, modular components to, to rebuild and reuse from those definitions. And so one of these I want to highlight, uh, this is going to be a little fuzzy when I zoom it in, but um, this is uh, just an example of one of the pipelines that the lab put together. Uh, so you take in a FASTQ file, you run it through QC, you extract some data for trimming, and then that gets passed on to a bow time mapping step. Uh, it's pretty pretty standard uh, beginning of a workflow like this and illustrates that you've got dependencies and uh, interconnections and files that get passed and uh, different uh, kind of uh, valves that you're pulling data out of. Uh, just to kind of set the stage there for what we're doing. So uh, I mentioned that we were uh, converting, you know, to this declarative CWL language, and so that, that architecture change really uh, required us to, to deconstruct the whole pipeline and rebuild from the bash group. So the, the easy part, well, the, the, the part that uh, Alex back there worked on that, uh, that took a lot of time and, and effort um, was to take the, the binaries that we were calling into, so, you know, your, your fast QC, your trimomatic, um, your aligners, um, peak calling tools, and find or build uh, CWL definitions. These are the YAML uh, specifications that define what the inputs and outputs of each tool are and how to execute that. Uh, so the, the binaries and wrappers from the pipelines become those 
uh, pieces. And then we use uh, sub-workflows. We use CWL workflows to group those together into steps. So the, the QC step is a workflow. The trimming step is a workflow. The mapping step is a workflow. And then one large master pipeline workflow to tie those sub-workflows together. Uh, so one of the side effects here uh, that was really kind of um, advantageous was isolating the, the data flow dependencies. So knowing which, which pieces of data are required at which, which step of the pipeline which can get a little cloudy if you have one big bash script to run everything. Um, it, not very challenging, but it really forced you to kind of think of the whole thing and, and uh, compartmentalize it. And so again, uh, credit to Alex back there uh, for, pointing that, for, for building all these out. Uh, just to uh, you know, describe this a little more, um, so we, you know, we have a, a, a pipeline for one of the variants of the pipeline uh, for ChIP-seq, and it calls down to a couple of different sub-workflows, and then within those there's a number of steps that do very pedestrian things like extract the base name of a file, count the number of reads in the file, run fast QC. So that's where you're really getting into the, the basement and the, the tools that need to operate on the data. Uh, I've got little Docker images there to uh, show that those, we, we Dockerize them, but we also uh, let them run without Docker too. Uh, so just to illustrate that, uh, this is that, that QC uh, step. So this is one of the five or six steps of the workflow, but it's got uh, six individual command steps in place, and I've tried to uh, show w which pieces connect to which. And what's, what becomes a little bit interesting about here, um, so when you're writing a script, you know, you just kind of figure out, well, what do I need to do next? What do I need to do next? What do I need to tell the computer to do next? Um, but with, with CWL, you kind of have to pull back a little bit and think about which, what function each step is a, a achieving. Uh, and in this case, things like extracting the base name is a bit of a hack. We could just use the echo command to print out what uh, the expression in the language was doing. And you can see that on our uh, GitHub repo for what these workflows look like. Uh, FastQC expectedly is, is calling down to FastQC. Uh, extracting from the report zip file that it creates is just running through on zip and then uh, filtering out a file name. So a little bit, this is getting a little bit, you know, technical and inside baseball, but it was, it, you know, interesting and somewhat enlightening to see uh, when you got to put everything into a, a small bucket, what, uh, what those buckets need to look like. Uh, so one of the side effects here, uh, and Michael alluded to this in his talk, is that um, there's no uh, branching or conditionals in CWL right now. So uh, when we have multiple different um, decisions to make in a workflow, we can't represent that in the language. And so we actually have to uh, kind of unroll those into multiple different workflows. Uh, and something that was a little bit uh, interesting and a bit of a learning curve was, you know, since you also don't have like declarative for loops, like I want to do this 10 times or loop over, you know, star dot uh, fast Q, you you uh, write, you know, tools to scatter or gather. So you say, I, I have an array of input files and I want to scatter out a job for all of these and then gather up the results and, and uh, funnel those back together. So it, it did increase the verbosity of some of the things, but we, we end up with uh, more tightly defined um, steps in the workflow. So here's just an example of the expanding the conditionals. So for the, the chip seek workflow, you know, we start right off the bat where we've got two uh, switches where we need to take a different path. Are we doing single end reads or paired end reads? Then what kind of peaks are we looking for? And then was this experiment conducted with control samples or without control samples? And so it really, you know, those are things that in, in a Python or a shell script, you just have an if statement and then you, you know, add some other commands and maybe that would pepper its way all the way through, uh, down through. But uh, with CWL right now, it forces us to really think about those. Uh, and so Alex has come up with a way to uh, generate our, you know, have a, have a core set of workflow uh, building blocks that we then run a Python script to template out and save them so we're not copying and pasting a bunch of uh, error-prone copy and paste code. Uh, so the standards were mentioned uh, briefly in the last talk. And one of the things that I've found here is that um, coming to the project, the use cases that were built into the standard and built into the implementation really uh, raised the bar for what we were able to start with. Uh, and so there was a lot of decisions made here, like we've got uh, JavaScript expressions inside the, the workflows that we can use to like slice and dice uh, strings or file names. And um, it, we rely on Linux conventions like uh, exit codes and input and output streams, globbing file names. 
and then finally things like Docker images and requirement specifications. We can say in a command line tool that this requires this specific Docker image that'll supply the binary. We can say it, it requires this many CPUs or this much memory or disk, which these are all kinds of things we'd wanna have uh, anyways and it's nice to have them uh, codified in the standard. So what, now that we've got all those uh, pieces together, uh, we're really close to having a, a, a workflow, a pipeline that we can share uh, to anyone that, that has a computer that can use it. Uh, so the workflow definitions are YAML, so they're readable, uh, they're publishable on GitHub. Uh, we can package up our runnable binaries in Docker or make them otherwise available, but Docker for the, uh, the easy use case. And then we just need a C CWL implementation to uh, run them on. So, uh, and just one point there. So we, we do have an academic cluster where we're not running Docker right now, and we're using a Helmod, or the extension uh, Helmod to Elmod, which lets us load and unload software packages as needed. So that kind of happens out of band with CWL, but that's one of the things we're uh, interested in pursuing uh, post 1.0 here. Uh, so just a brief, a uh, little bit more info on that cluster. So we have a, a Slurm cluster. There's uh, the info slightly out of date. We have uh, over 50 nodes now, so there's more cores than that. There's a shared file system. It's your typical uh, academic HPC cluster. Uh, and so to, to take something like the CWL reference implementation and run this pipeline with these five stages, uh, we, you see that we've got some steps that are gonna take more CPU and, and memory and some steps that are gonna finish quicker. Uh, but if we just try to run the, uh, the standard CWL tool reference implementation, we kind of have to schedule it like this. We say, we need this big block of resources for this big block of time. And that's a little bit naive, but it's also uh, you know, a simple implementation that, uh, that isn't really designed for scaling to HPC clusters. So another one of the challenges was to uh, deal with that. And we found, uh, and I think Peter's gonna talk about this in the next uh, piece, uh, another one of the CWL implementations is called Toil. Uh, it's a workflow um, platform that it does more than CWL, but it also does CWL. And they have extensive, uh, extensible cluster support for running on various uh, local clusters, cloud uh, platforms, LSF, uh, Grid Engine, Mesos, and now Slurm, since part of this uh, endeavor here was to uh, build out a, a plugin to run uh, to connect Toil to be able to run on Slurm. And so that was, that's been really helpful for us since we have a Slurm cluster. Uh, so th that really addresses the scalability uh, problem. So once we have a workflow, everything's well-defined and we can run it, we can run it easily with the free, easy to install CWL tool. We can also take it and, and scale it up to our cluster when we have a platform that'll take advantage of that. Uh, so I'm just gonna show this real briefly. It's a animation that I probably spent too much time on, but um, you take a, you know, now that we've, you know, we've got this idea of, we know that this FastQC job may only require two, two gigabytes of RAM, but uh, maybe some CPUs, and uh, the workflow doesn't need to know anything about how the things are scheduled. Toil can find a node for that in our cluster, place it on there. Next step that comes up is the, uh, maybe uh, an alignment step that doesn't really depend on the QC, but uh, humor me on that one. Uh, so maybe that requires more resources so it gets a bigger node one of those finishes, and all the while, Toil is keeping track of what it told uh, CWL it was doing and what it farmed out to the Slurm cluster. Uh, so that's kind of the, uh, the project in a nutshell, um, some of the challenges and things that we found. And you know, I really have to um, give a lot of uh, kudos to the, the CWL uh, community for, for building this, uh, this blueprint for us to be able to, to use and, and all these, uh, the, the standard really provide a, a common uh, way forward to, to do these things. Um, and as also speaking towards the innovation, it's really helped us uh, share these processes internally and externally and make sure that they are in fact repeatable. Uh, so things that do run on our cluster, run on my laptop, run on Alex's laptop, and can, can run everywhere. So we're, we're getting past that, like, oh, it worked on my machine, and let's publish it and, and figure out what went wrong. Uh, well, uh, one thing uh, to call back to the keynote uh, address this morning, uh, you really need to um, get out there and do stuff. Uh, so a lot of this wouldn't happen without the, the great support of the community, but some of these projects, the, the Toil Slurm support, we really just had to pick up and, and commit to and, and run with. Uh, and so that's, you know, that's this open source conference. I'm sure you're all familiar with that idea, but it's, uh, I'll just emphasize that again. So, uh, and in the future, we just wanna uh, be looking at 
how to deal with provenance and other metadata in between these steps, how to uh, really make sure we're uh, capturing the information about our data and our processes, and how to support tool registries beyond Docker for that, uh, for that bit. Uh, some, some brief acknowledgments, the uh, folks in uh, GCB computational solutions that have uh, you know, supported on software and infrastructure, uh, the CWL and Toyo communities that have uh, worked with us through the uh, Hangouts and uh, weekly chats, and some uh, funding from the Duke University School of Medicine and uh, NIH for the GGR project. Uh, so I'm going to leave this up here. Uh, if you want to look at our GitHub, our website, or our Docker images, um, and at this point, uh, I'd like to open the floor if anyone has any questions.